What's up guys, Enriku here. Going to be reviewing Volume 33 for Berserk today. I apologize Apologize, I didn't do this last week. I also do plan on buying 34, 35, 36, and 37 today, so hopefully I'll have them by next Monday to continue with the series. Now, this volume was very quick. It was a quick read. I think I read it in 30 minutes. Um, very straightforward, a very relaxed read, a very uh, essential volume to build up for what's going to occur in the next volume and the volumes to come. The first thing I want to talk about is the Beast of Darkness willingly suppressing himself and going into the darkness and saying, you know, you can't restrain me, but I will bide my time for now until we get to that sun that burns us, to that fire that burns us. And obviously he's talking about Griffith because it shows the Beast of Darkness looking up at a hawk of light. So I really enjoyed that. Um, but it shows us that, you know, this is Guts's corrupted ego trying to fight him. This is his ID, his subconscious. And he only exists because, you know, he wants to go after... Griffith, you know, it was created through the eclipse, it was created through Guts' revenge and, and the hatred for Griffith, but it was interesting seeing it, you know, kind of restrained and whatnot, and apparently Shirke is the one that did so, but he said, since you got that shell, which is the Berserker armor, you released me and you can't get rid of me. Uh, I enjoyed seeing the main cast, you know, Guts' crew on the uh, Roderick ship and everything going on, I liked seeing that Roderick is known as a formidable opponent on the sea, I liked seeing how skilled he is taking out those pirates that we've seen at the you know, Vitranis. I like seeing how Roderick he kind of uplifted Farnese's spirit, saying, you know, you, you, you fit a role, you know, everybody has a role. Guts Guts gives you, you know, he trusts you with something that means the most in the world to him. You know, so I really enjoyed that. I would love for Roderick and Farnese to end up together, because Roderick right now has become a good character in my eyes. I like the character a lot. I would love to see more about his backstory, and for, to see him get some character development, but for right now, he to me feels like a supporting character, sort of like um, Lando, Car Car you know, Lando in um, Star Wars. That's what I feel like he is. Like uh, Roderick is um, Guts is Lando, you know, and, and Guts is Han. That's what I feel like it is. Uh, I think that's a good analogy. But um, I would like to see more of the character. Now we see Shirke and Farnese, you know, kind of up when they were floating around, and Roderick asks Guts, you know, what is Casca to you? They didn't want to hear it. And they feel like they have feelings for Guts, but I think they're misinterpreting their feelings. I don't think it's feelings of love. I think it's feelings of admiration, and they, they respect him. You know, they, they changed their lives. They, he changed their lives, basically. They, they you know, they, he's an important person to them, but I don't think they love him. And I really would love to see Isidro end up with... Shirke and Farnese to end up with either Serpico. I know it's her half brother, but you know, back in these times, that kind of shit happened. Or with Roderick, uh, but it was cool to see each and in, each individual's you know inner thoughts or inner monologues and whatnot during their time on the ship, except for Isidro and really Serpico. We really didn't see much of that. It was mainly Shirke, Farnese, and Guts. But that was enjoyable. Then we move on to, um, I believe it was. Ganesha, and this dude reincarnating himself once again, becoming something beyond an apostle because he knows he will not be able to beat Griffith, and going into this reincarnation vessel that we've seen in earlier volumes that apparently Diver spent his whole life building, and Diver's like, don't do this, don't do this, and you know, we see Sir Laban talking to these children, they have a, they got the dream where the, you know, the, uh, Hawk of Light tells them the fog is going to clear, but that's not the true the true morning yet. Then the light of Hawk comes, gets rid of the darkness, and then the true morning comes. And everything's going according to this prophecy. You know, the, the, the fog clears, keeping everybody, all the, all the Midlanders inside, away from the fog, which saps life and soul from whatever it touches, to reincarnate. You know, Ganesha. So Griffith, Griffith, or maybe even Sonya, because Sonya has the power to you know to see the future and whatnot. One of the two basically warned their subjects, and in the process, I feel like everything is going according to Griffith's plan, because if whoever's prophesizing this and relaying these messages through the dreams, they know what's going to happen next. So they know Ganesha was going to do this. So they know Ganesha was going to turn into something that he got turned into at the end of this volume, which was that gigantic-looking gigantic monster, which apparently is like the, she the god of Shiva and shit like that, you know, Shiva and whatnot. But uh, I feel like everything's going according to plan. You know, Griffith is just standing there looking up at it, and he doesn't give a fuck. The dude just, like, watching. Like, he's not scared. But now comes the question that I have a feeling that 
the band of the hawk are going to have to take their apostle forms. There's no doubt in my mind to be able to defeat Ganesha and their, you know, their subjects, the people that they're saving. They're watching this battle. What are they going to think when they see that their would-be saviors are the same as the, the you know, their capture, you know, their their their, their enemy, Ganesha, their apostles, their demons. What are they going to think? Are they going to pledge themselves regardless because, you know, the Band of the Hawk saved them, despite them being apostles? Or are they going to fear them? And there's a moment in this volume that makes me feel like it's going to be mixed feelings because the dude, that the young master of the Bakaraka clan, makes he gets offered to join the Band of the Hawk by one of the Kushan that joined the Band of the Hawk that was once a war slave but now is a part of the Band of the Hawk, part of the espionage, which... Once again, was was absolutely brilliant because this was all part of Griffith's plan to get the enemy onto his side so he can use them as spies and whatnot. Like fucking crazy, man! <laughs> absolutely ingenious. Um, but it kind of helps when you have somebody that can prophesize for you and shit, aka Sonia. But uh, the, he got offered to join, and the Bakaraka young masters like, you know, I lived long enough to to know should I give myself to something that's inscrutable, the inscrutable flow and whatnot. And Le bon was like, whoa, that's kind of true. Like, should we just trust trust the inscrutable? Like, you know, should we just go along with it? Because it might feel right now, but later it might not might not, might not be the right choice. So I have a feeling if it comes down to this where, the, where they have to show their apostle form, some of the people in Midland are going to be like, whatever, they saved us. There are people that they're strong enough to, you know, protect us, and I think some are going to be like, well, why are we going to pledge ourselves to the exact same thing that was trying to kill us? You know, they, they come from the same species. So, I kind of want to see what goes down with that, because they're going to have to take their apostle form. There's no doubt in my mind. I mean, Kanishka's a gigantic motherfucker right now. I mean, he has power. And now, on the mindset of Ganeshka, I think that dude is totally out of it now. He's walking, he looks down, he has like this god complex. He already had that, pretty much, but... He steps on these insects, which are people, and then he's like, oh, red flowers are blooming. I don't know if he's just so high up he doesn't realize what's below him, or if he's just completely out of it, and his mind is just, like, destroyed, you know what I mean? He's very simple-minded and whatnot, because he's all about power and stuff now, and he always was, but he seems very simple-minded. His mind is fogged and everything, so I, I, I want to see more of Ganesha and what exactly is going on with him. But everything in this volume flowed so well, you know... Uh, everything worked hand in hand as well. Like it's kind of like a build up. Like I said, we got to see what the children said about the dream, and then exactly that happened. The fog cleared, which was actually Ganesha doing it, and just Griffith, you know, the dream warning the Midlanders to stay the fuck inside and not touch the fog. So it just everything just worked in in in, in a in a linear process, and it's just amazing to see. Like Kentaro Miura's storytelling is absolutely incredible. The foreshadowing is incredible as well. And I can't wait to see what's going to happen in volume 20, uh, 34 because you guys told me I am not ready. I am not ready for that volume. I heard the artwork is absolutely amazing. Probably the best artwork in all of Berserk. And uh, I can't wait to see how the Band of the Hawk are going to take out Kanisha. Because it's going to happen. And I really do feel like Griffith is going to establish his own kingdom of Falconia. Um, and the Millennium Falcon, whatever the fuck it's going to be called. Um, because the bottom line is... He's one step of his enemy right now, you know. Basically, Ganesh is just in his way. He's an object, a obstacle in the flow of time, in the flow of ca causality and whatnot. That's just how it feels. And, you know, he's obviously one step ahead because he knew the fog was going to clear, warning the Midlanders, basically. So, the dude is, he, he's, he's going to end up winning. But, obviously, it's going to be a crazy battle, and I do feel like they're going to have to take their apostle forms. What are your thoughts on that, guys? Obviously, a lot of you guys are, you know, watching these Vine reviews. You already read the uh, read the series. Um, anybody that's new, it, new to it and then watching it with me, what are your thoughts on it and uh, are reading it with me? If you haven't read ahead, what are your thoughts? Do you agree with me, disagree with me? Um... Should I do a live reading slash uh, live reaction to volume 34? Basically, I would do it on Google Hangout, so it'd be a setup hangout, so we can all, you know, you can actually watch it live, and I would read the volume and whatnot, give you my commentary, my thoughts, my, my raw reactions, show you different artwork, because apparently, like I said, the artwork is amazing in volume 34. Would that be something you guys would be interested in, watching me, you know, watching it, like, basically coming into a, coming into a hangout, and me doing a live reaction to Vime 34. I want your thoughts on that. Leave it down below in the comments. I need feedback on that. 
Uh, hopefully, I have it by next Monday. And if that's what you guys want to see, that's what I'm going to do. I want to deliver that to you guys. But um, I think that's it. I touched base on everything. Oh, Shirke and Guts apparently have something more than just, you know, Shirke is like, we have something, so it's okay if, you know, Casca is Guts' woman. They're sort of like intertwined because their ethereal bodies overlapped a little bit. So Shirke, when she was like writing on Guts' uh, skin for the talisman, she kind of felt it stinging a little bit. The, you know, the burns were burning. She kind of felt like she was hot. So she could sort of, she was sort of like ethereally linked. I thought that was kind of interesting, but that, that's just a side note. Please like the video if you feel I deserve it. Subscribe if you haven't done so. I would greatly appreciate it. But that's all I have for you guys. Thank you for watching, and I'll catch you in the next video.